Well, because obviously uh, we were starting in a slightly different order. The right to know, as, as she just concluded, is what this is all about. Your right to know, your parents and teachers' rights to know. And I'm going to talk with you about the implications of current science for policy. Now, um, there are studies on children, as she indicated, but what we also know is that this technology is being used in ways that are highly inappropriate. There's a baby bouncy chair with an iPad right over it, designed for infants. There's an iPod, and there's a plastic TV rattle case for the iPhone, and there's one for the iPad, a TV rattle case. Now, these things, I believe, are a form of child abuse. <laughs> They are, because the parents who buy these things for their children do not know that they're giving their child a two-way microwave radio. They don't realize that radio frequency energy is actually microwave radiation. And in fact, the term radio frequency energy was devised when women didn't want to buy radar ranges. Do you remember radar ranges? Okay. Radar ranges was what the guys who invented the microwave oven first decided to call it, and women didn't think it was very much fun to put with radar, which guys thought was very cool. So they came up with the term microwave. It sounded more feminine, more interesting for women, perhaps. And as a consequence, it did, in fact, sell very well. It's now become a <coughs> staple of most homes throughout the world. But the reality is that we know very little about its long-term effects in the microwave emitting devices that are being held right next to our brains and bodies around the world today. And if you give a child a phone, this is what happens to it. Children learn with their mouths. They learn with touching and feeling and tasting. And a phone, of course, is not something that belongs in anyone's mouth. The electromagnetic spectrum runs all the way from the light that is here to that in x-rays and gamma rays and space. The energy in the smallest high intensity waves of the x-rays and gamma rays, of course, breaks DNA bonds directly. We know that. It's damaging to health. The microwave oven, the cell phone, and the cordless phone are all using the same frequency. Take this over. Do you want me to hold it? I can do that. Yeah, fine. This is the preferred bit. Okay. The difference is in the amount of power. It takes a thousand watts of power in a microwave oven to cook a cup of water very quickly. A cell phone uses less than one watt of power, so it doesn't cook anything. But it's not the power of the phone that's important, it's the pulse. And it's the pulse signal from the cell phone that is most important. Its ability to go over and over and over again. That pulsed digital signal is too weak to break DNA, but it damages DNA in other ways. This is just an illustration of the complexity of the waves that we're dealing with. They have frequency of about, about 2 billion cycles a second for the Wi-Fi radio frequency microwave end of the spectrum. They have amplitude, they have information content, and it's the information content that may be biologically most important. I want you to look at this very briefly because you will see this is a four second phone call. This is the change in volts per meter over four seconds. And it's this huge change in four seconds repeated over thousands of minutes, over many life, many months, over many years that we believe is biologically important. And that has been associated with a whole host of serious chronic diseases at this point. The worst time to have a phone right next to your head is when you first answer it. Answer it on a speaker phone. Don't have it next in your body. Don't keep it in your pocket when you're wet all day long because it's sending signals and those signals are getting into you. Standards for cell phones have not changed for 18 years. Would you drive willingly buy a new car with 18-year-old safety standards? Would you fly in a plane with 18-year-old safety standards that hadn't been up to date? I don't think so. Now, it's important to understand that the business community realizes there's a big risk here. At least the insurance industry, for more than 20 years, has refused to write policies to cover health damages 
from cell phones and other wireless radiation, arguing that it's a major risk. The risks from dangers to EMF, they classify as an emergent risk, one of the top six risks to businesses in the world today. The same category once occupied by asbestos. That's telling you something. It's also a message to the school boards. If you are on a school board, you're responsible for the health of the students in your school. And if you are willingly exposing them to something that could cause cancer in them, that Lloyds of London won't insure, then you're going to be liable for the damages that you're causing down the road. And the World Health Organization in 2011 declared cell phone and other wireless radiation a possible human carcinogen the same category as DDT, lead, and engine exhaust. Now, would you give DDT, lead, or engine exhaust to your children to play with? Would you let that be spread throughout their schools? Then I don't understand the proliferation of Wi-Fi without controls on exposure, the proliferation of Wi-Fi, especially in the environments of young children. We know that children absorb more microwave radiation, and because of the of the lack of time that we have right now, I'll simply say a child will absorb more, the fetus will absorb the most, and we need to protect children. I'm going to show you now some unpublished data that will not be in our final video, um, which have been developed by the Environmental Health Trust, the nonprofit that I had started, with researchers at the University of Porto Alegre. And by the way, those of you who buy the book that is in the back of the room, the sale of that book goes to support this research. And that's what we've done with Environmental Health Trust, is to set up a way to fund this work that we're doing here, among others. And what we found, with the yellow indicating the white hot, and the um, darkest being the less, least exposure, is that a six-year-old brain will absorb quite a bit of radiation all the way into the eye and all the way down to the brain stem. This has not been done before in this manner. This is the 11-year-old brain, and you can see the exposure is a little bit less big, the 11-year-old. And this contrasts with the 34-year-old. Again, I'll just show those to you very quickly so you can see the contrast. The six-year-old, this is based on MRIs of the brain of real, a real child. This is the 11-year-old, and this is the 34-year-old. And obviously, the adult is going to absorb less radiation, and even if a child and an adult absorb the same radiation. The child's brain is still developing. It's not fully myelinated, it's not protected, and therefore it can potentially absorb more radiation. The, here you see the highest rate of the yellow white is into the fetus, a, a nine-month-old fetus will absorb the most radiation. That is why we started the Baby Safe Project with Chairman of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Yale University, Hugh Taylor, and more than 100 other experts in obstetrics and gynecology to, so that pregnant women will know they should not be exposing the abdomen to cell phone radiation. Now, studies have also shown that the Wi-Fi radiation will cause more damage to the sperm. And sperm have DNA as well, and the DNA of sperm exposed to Wi-Fi from a laptop gets more fragmented, and you can see there's three times more damage to the sperm that's been exposed to Wi-Fi radiation. Do you see that big column on the right? As opposed to the control on the left. Three times more damage from Wi-Fi from a laptop. This is the adult rat testicle. The testicle of a rat is different from a human, but it is similar in that it is like human testicles. They are not protected. They are more vulnerable. The testicular barrier, so-called, is 100 times more sensitive than any other part of the human skin. We know that the test testicles need to be kept cool, otherwise you can't make healthy sperm. And that is what led my colleague, Dr. Sharma, to do his research on the effects of microwave radiation from cell phones on reproduction, because he began his career as an expert in male reproductive health, and he recognized that cell phones could possibly be damaging because contrary to manufacturers' assertions, they do in fact, they do in fact 
change the way the testicles function, and he will show you some of that work. This is one example of a study that was done exposing the male rat to cell phone radiation for just 15, 30 minutes, or 60 minutes a day. An hour a day for less for two weeks resulted in damage to the integrity of the membrane of cells found within the male rat testicle. Now, children's risk of brain cancer is something that we all dread studying, but we definitely need to study. And this study was done in Scandinavia where there's been more use of cell phones for longer. They studied children ages seven to 19, and unfortunately they had 352 cases of malignant brain cancer in these children. And they compared those children with the cases of brain cancer with other children who were controls who did not have brain cancer. And they asked and got detailed information about their cell phone use. And what they found was that there was no overall risk, but when they looked at the children with the heaviest use, more than 2.8 years of use, they found a doubled risk of brain cancer. And an interesting thing with their data, which we have recently recalculated, this is their data. The longer and more calls these children made, they made 144 hours of phone calls, 144 hours in a young child's life. They had a very much higher risk of developing brain cancer than those who made fewer calls. And we call this a dose-response relationship. Now, the authors said that their study, quote, does not support a causal interpretation. We cannot, however, rule out the possibility that mobile phones confer a small increase in risk and therefore emphasize the importance of future studies. <clears throat> well, let me ask you something. Do you want your children to have a small increase in risk of brain cancer? I don't want my grandchildren to have any increased risk of brain cancer. And if there is even the possibility of an increased risk of brain cancer, aren't we obligated to protect our children rather than to require them to bring cell phones to schools, to use them for learning purposes in schools? Now, the World Health Organization in 2011 said it was a possible human carcinogen. My colleagues and I from the WHO, who were part of the World Health Organization review process, recently published an article saying we think it's a probable human carcinogen. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go into those data in any details, but I will just tell you that just as Dr. Kaffensteiner Adair alluded, in Asia there's a lot of concern about this. There are camps to detox children now Children are being treated at McLean Hospital for digital addiction now. And the South Korean government has declared digital dementia a serious problem in their children. And it's characterized by a properly developed left hemisphere, so they're really smart with math and numbers and things, but a lack of development of the right hemisphere, which governs empathy and impulse control, the ability to control themselves, to soothe themselves, the ability to have empathy and think about others. Imagine what this will mean if we have a generation of children who are deficient in the ability to think of others and have control their impulses. The government of Korea has published these data showing smartphone addiction increased, increased in their survey in 2012 in youth so that up to almost one in five children between the age, one in five children is addicted. And they also reported a doubling in the number of cases of dementia diagnosed from 2006 in those under the age of 65. Normally, of course, dementia is a disease associated with aging. Is How are you defining addiction? The government of Korea has its definition. And I think that's, a, why don't we hold that question for discussion with Dr. Steiner Adair afterwards. Now, I want to share with you the results of research done at Yale University on prenatal, that's effects during pregnancy, effects of exposing mice during pregnancy to cell phone radiation, reported uh, in a very prestigious scientific publication by the chairman of obstetrics and gynecology, Professor Hugh Taylor at Yale. These graphs basically show you the differences between the exposure
exposed and the control with respect to memory, hyperactivity, and anxiety. And you can see an increase in hyperactivity uh, and a reduction in anxiety, which, and that, which is inappropriate reduction of anxiety. And they also had problems of memory. And these differences are statistically significant. The mice born to mice mothers that were exposed to cell phones were more hyperactive. Dr. Taylor said they were bouncing off the walls. So we have now launched a website, showthefineprint.org. That website takes the information that is currently buried in all the manuals, as I showed you at the outset in your, in your iPhone, and makes it available. It's a publicly accessible website. Please share it with everybody. And this is why we think your town and towns around this country can pass the cell phone right to know ordinance. It simply says where there are manufacturers advice about safe distance, make it publicly available where people buy the phones before they buy the phone. Why do you have to go find it afterwards? And as I indicated, Professor Lawrence Lessig of Harvard Law School has agreed to defend any city that will pass that law all the way to the Supreme Court, and indeed that is what's going to happen. It will be challenged by the industry, just as the tobacco industry has challenged efforts to compel them to put graphic labels on tobacco. They have argued it's a form of compelled speech violating their First Amendment rights, and the Supreme Court will have to consider that. In fact, the same attorneys are working on that argument for the tobacco industry the same arguments are being made with similar attorneys working for the cell phone industry, maintaining that it's a violation of their First Amendment rights to force them to tell you before you buy the phone the advice about how to use it safely that you will find if you know how to look for it afterward. So please look at our website and tell all of your friends and family to do so as well. Pregnancy is a time that needs special protection. These are some of the things that we are doing with the Baby Safe Project, which we provide web, a website and information and scientific studies that we've developed with Grassroots Environmental Education and Environmental Health Trust. And this is some of the practical advice. We have handouts there. But if you go to our website, you can sign up for our handouts. You can sign up to give them away we're always looking for volunteers who want to help us get the message out. Environmental Health Trust put on this event tonight because we learned that this is a community that's really keen to have more information on this issue. Those in this room who have put together this event and got you to show up, let's give them a hand of applause. are making the world safer for your neighbors, whether or not they know it. And someday they're going to thank you in my lifetime. <laughs> Many countries around the world are taking similar actions. You'll hear from Dr. Sharma about some of them. The advice is very similar. Use a speakerphone, use a headset. Don't use your phone when the signal is weak. We can talk about that more when you have a chance to. But I want you to understand the concerns about this are growing around the world. In Belgium, the minister has banned the sale or advertisement of phones for seven-year-olds. This is a law. This is a law. In France, it's a law as well. And there, you will hear more from Mr. Clegg about what they're doing in France. Um, the limited, uh, limiting population exposure is a mission and a goal of the French government. Cities are taking action in Toronto, but in Berkeley, Last month, I was proud to be part of a team that's been working for many years to see a unanimous passage of the cell phone right to know ordinance, something that I think could easily be done here. And why is it easy and why is it important? Because unlike so many environmental problems like global warming, this is something you can fix tomorrow. You can let people know now about these warnings. Get your phones out of your pockets. Don't have young women sleep with them or put them in their bras. The solution is not that difficult. And if industry is required to do this, Mr. Clegg will explain to you as the former 
president of Microsoft Canada, industry will do it. They'll figure it out. We just need to give them a nudge, a pretty big nudge, but a nudge nonetheless. So in conclusion, we want to save the girls, we want to save the boys, we want the world to be aware that there are simple steps you can take now to protect yourselves and your family. And we're looking forward to discussing more of this tonight, and we're going to keep our conversations short so that we can have an opportunity to discuss with you how we will develop them.